has been one of our most popular speakers for uh, Sunday Symposium. Mark retired in 2011 after 35 years of military and federal civil service. In his last position, he served as the senior specialist in domestic intelligence and counterterrorism at the Congressional Research Service in Washington, DC. In prior assignments, he was the director of counterterrorism policy at the Department of Homeland Security and was one of the first cadre of federal security directors for the Transportation Security Administration, TSA. Today, Mark consults and conducts training on security issues. He is a frequent speaker on intelligence, terrorism, homeland security, and cybersecurity topics. He also serves as a member of our of the board of directors of the Oakmont Village Association. And we thank you for all your service. You. Mark is a veteran of the US Air Force. He had assignments in Taiwan, Germany, Korea, and the National Security Agency. He's a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, and he has graduate degrees from Georgetown University and Catholic University in Washington, DC. Finally, Mark is uniquely qualified with his past experience in intelligence work to give us his thoughts on this complicated issue. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thanks to all of you for coming out this morning. I especially wanna welcome those of you who forgot to put your clocks back and have been here for an hour waiting patiently for the program to start. Um, but anyway, it's great to see a lot of old friends and I'm looking forward to this presentation. Uh, Lynn said that I was uniquely qualified because I had worked for a few years in the intelligence community. Um, there would be those in Washington DC who would make the opposite conclusion and say you're uniquely unqualified to speak to the issue. And, uh, uh, but, but be that as it may, since I've been in Oakmont for 10 years, I've been taking the time to uh, research various topics of interest and obviously Afghanistan's at the top of that list. Uh, so let me go ahead and start the presentation here. This is a famous, uh, famous photograph that you'll recognize. At the end of April, 1975, as the North Vietnamese army was advancing on Saigon, the United States military uh, ran helicopters every 10 minutes to the roof of the uh, embassy in Saigon to evacuate U.S. diplomats and their Vietnamese allies. Um, this very iconic photograph was taken by the Dutch photojournalist Hugh Van S. This is a still photograph from a video taken here this past summer. And if there is one photograph that may be emblematic emblematic of the US uh, engagement in Afghanistan, it might be this particular photograph. Or then again, it could be this particular photograph, which shows a US Marine carrying a, a baby over the wire there at Kabul uh, International Airport. Or it even could be this photograph, which is a night vision image of the last American soldier leaving Afghanistan this past summer. And that would be uh, Major General Chris Donahue, who is the commander of the 82nd Airborne. The stunning collapse of the Afghan government and its national army had media commentators and politicians across the political spectrum, pointing fingers, casting blame, and engaged in selective memory. Members of Congress complained that President Biden ignored their advice of his generals. Some US senators, as you may recall, demanded the resignations of the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The news media universally declared that the US withdrawal from Afghanistan was chaotic. They said it so many times, Americans actually came to believe them 
even though over 124,000 Americans and their closest Afghan partners and families were successfully evacuated in just 17 days in one of the largest airlifts in history. Most people call it the war in Afghanistan and at nearly 20 years, America's longest. Many also claim it was a war the United States lost, but it was not a war in the traditional sense. Two armies did not confront each other on the battlefield. There were combat operations, sometimes intense, but these occurred in the context of a counterinsurgency, which is a different kettle of fish. For example, air operations targeting suspected militants were often undertaken by unmanned drones, such as the MQ-9 Reaper shown here in this slide. And it's very interesting about drone warfare. Uh, it takes more than 200 personnel to launch and then operate for 24 hours and then recover a single drone. But less than half of those personnel were located within the theater of combat. The majority, such as the analysts who provide intelligence and the operators who maneuver the drone and fire its missiles, were located thousands of miles away in command and control buildings at US Air Force bases in Nevada and New Mexico. In any event, the US military and its NATO allies almost never lost an engagement with their adversary. The Taliban, in fact, suffered 10 times the battlefield losses as the Allies did. That's not what military defeat looks like. But as the 19th century Prussian strategist Karl von Clausewitz reminds us, war is a mere continuation of policy with other means. What he meant by this is that the employment of armed forces is part of a mix which includes diplomatic, economic, and ideological tools to pursue political objectives. So what were America's political objectives in Afghanistan? And why after a two decade effort did the United States leave the country? Long and thoughtful analyses have already been written on this subject and more are to follow. So what can I add to this story? For the next half hour or so, I'm gonna take a look at the American enterprise in Afghanistan in a broad way. And I hope to shed light on these four questions. Why did the United States go into Afghanistan? What challenges did we face? Why did we stay so long? And why did we decide to leave? I'd like to start with a quick historical overview that will help put America's involvement in Afghanistan in perspective. And that involvement goes back 40 years, not 20. The 1970s was a period of considerable political rest in Afghanistan following a terrible famine at the beginning of the decade that killed thousands. In 1973, Army General Mohammad Duad Khan overthrew the country's last king disbanded the parliament and judiciary and established a one-party state with him as president. In 1978, he was in turn overthrown in a coup led by Noor Taraki, one of the founding members of the Afghan Communist Party. Taraki signed a friendship treaty with the Soviet Union and began to move the country in a socialist direction. Conservative Islamic and ethnic leaders in the country opposed the new government, particularly to social changes, which interestingly enough included expanded rights for women. Soon a variety of opposition groups coalesced into a guerrilla movement to fight the government. They were called the Mujahideen. In 1979, Taraki himself was overthrown and murdered to help bolster the government of, of their faltering ally, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan on Christmas Eve, 1979. Nearly 100,000 Soviet soldiers took control of major cities and highways. Opposition was intense, but the Soviets dealt harshly with the Mujahideen rebels and those who supported them. 
massacring civilians and destroying entire villages in order to deny safe haven to opposition fighters. In response to the Soviet invasion, foreign support to the Mujahideen poured in from Iran, Pakistan, and China. The United States also entered the fray. Particularly impactful were the Stinger shoulder-fired surface-to-air missiles provided to the Mujahideen, which allowed them to neutralize Soviet air superiority. Afghan guerrillas soon gained control of rural areas, while Soviet troops held the urban areas. In the brutal nine-year conflict, an estimated one million civilians were killed, as well as 90,000 Mujahideen fighters, 18,000 Afghan troops, and 14,500 Soviet soldiers. By 1988, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev had seen enough and sought a way out of Russia's Afghanistan intervention. He negotiated a peace treaty guaranteeing Afghan independence in exchange for the withdrawal of Soviet troops. Now, I want you to hold that thought. This pattern will repeat itself in 30 years. The last Soviet troops departed in February 1989, creating a power vacuum. The United States, fresh off a victory of sorts in this proxy war against the Soviet Union, abandoned Afghanistan as well. The heavily armed Mujahideen groups created a lawless environment in which ordinary Afghans paid a terrible cost. Tens of thousands were killed. Murder, coercion, rape, corruption, and robbery by these groups were commonplace. The leader of these groups, known as warlords, and their militia remained divided along ethnic lines. For some of the men who had fought, out to, drive, who had fought to drive out the Soviet army, the violence and chaos plaguing Afghanistan was a bitter disappointment. They came to believe that Afghanistan's salvation came only by drawing upon Islamist religious principles. These men formed a new armed movement based on an extreme interpretation of Sunni Islam. They called themselves the Taliban. They organized their own powerful militia and took on the warlords. Radical Islamists from outside Afghanistan came by the thousands to support the Taliban in their fight to take control of the country. This resulted in another brutal civil war where 100,000 more Afghans were killed. In 1996, the Taliban seized power in Kabul, but ethnic groups in the North, called the Northern Alliance, and in the South, aided in part by Hamid Karzai, continued to battle the Taliban for control of the country. Most Afghans, exhausted by years of drought, famine, and war, accepted the Taliban who cracked down on crime, but also imposed strict Sharia law. Women were banned from working, schools for girls were shut down, and women were forced to be completely veiled. Games, music, and television were banned. These edicts were forced by public executions and amputations. Also, once in power, the Taliban provided sanctuary to Osama bin Laden and many of his Al-Qaeda followers after they were forced to flee from Sudan. Al-Qaeda had an ambitious international jihadist agenda. On August 7, 1998, they helped plan nearly simultaneous truck bomb attacks against American embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya. Those killed over 200. In response, President Clinton ordered 75 missiles fired at Al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan, killing several militants, but no senior members of Al-Qaeda. On October 12, 2000, an Al-Qaeda-linked group conducted a suicide bombing against the USS Cole, a guided missile destroyer being refueled in Yemen's Aden Harbor. 17 U.S. Navy seamen died in the attack. Three years later, Al-Qaeda was ready to strike an even greater blow to the United States. But to preserve his sanctuary in Afghanistan, bin Laden needed the Taliban's leaders to shield him from the outside world. He offered to assassinate Ahmad Shah Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance, and the last organized resistance to the Taliban. On September 9, 2001, two Tunisian men, disguised as television journalists, killed Massoud with a bomb hidden inside 
a television camera. Two days later, Al-Qaeda militants hijacked four commercial aircraft and crashed them into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania. It was the worst terrorist attack in American history. On September 14th, Congress passed the authorization for the use of military force. It authorized US forces to target those who planned, authorized, or committed the attacks and those who aided or harbored them. The United States also demanded that the Afghanistan government turn over Osama bin Laden. The Taliban refused. On October 7, 2001, the United States and Great Britain launched airstrikes against targets in Afghanistan and bases belonging to the Al Qaeda network. This is, was the beginning of what we commonly call the war in Afghanistan, although military operations were only part of the two decade engagement. Within weeks, US forces, primarily CIA paramilitary units working together with their Afghan, Afghan allies from the Northern Alliance, had killed or captured thousands of militants. On November 13th, the Northern Alliance entered Kabul. The retreating Taliban fled south. On December 7th, Taliban fighters abandoned their final stronghold in Kandahar as the militants group on Afghanistan disintegrated. Two days later, the Taliban surrendered. U.S. forces in the Northern Alliance had tremendous success in defeating the Taliban and scattering its fighters. But one critically important objective remained undone, Osama bin Laden, who was wanted dead or alive. By early December 2001, bin Laden was cornered in some of the most forbidding terrain on the earth, about 30 miles from the famous Khyber Pass. He was hiding inside a complex of caves and tunnels carved into a mountainous section of eastern Afghanistan known as Tora Bora. And if you look on this map, look for Kabul, and then look to the east of Jalalabad, and then you'll see Tora Bora in the center there. He and several hundred of his men endured relentless pounding by American warplanes, as many as 100 strikes a day. Fewer than 100 American commandos were on the scene with their Afghan allies, but calls for reinforcements to launch an assault were rejected. Requests were also turned down for US troops to block the mountain paths leading to sanctuary a few miles away in Pakistan. The vast array of American military power from sniper teams to the most mobile divisions of the Marine Corps and the Army were kept on the sidelines. Instead, the US command chose to rely on airstrikes and untrained Afghan militias to attack bin Laden and on Pakistan's loosely organized frontier corps to seal his escape routes. On or about December 16th, bin Laden and his bodyguards walked unmolested out of Tora Bora and disappeared into Pakistan's unregulated tribal areas. It would be the first of many disappointments for the United States in the land called the Graveyard of Empires. Meanwhile, in December, the United Nations sponsored a loya jirga of the major Afghan factions. The, Pal the Taliban were not invited. On December 5th, the factions signed the Bonn Agreement, which established an interim administration in the country led by Hamid Karzai. Senior Taliban leaders tried to negotiate a peace deal with Karzai. They were willing to lay down their arms and recognize Afghanistan's new government, but the Bush administration vetoed any role for the Taliban in a post-invasion Iraq. They had bigger aspirations for the country. This is when the American in engagement in Afghanistan took a decisive turn. The mission expanded beyond the objective of preventing future attacks on the United States and denying a safe haven for terrorists. The Bush administration now sought to bolster Afghan civil society and governance, boost the country's economy, and build up its police and military forces. These ambitious nation building goals would require billions of dollars over an extended period. It was an enterprise do-gooders in America and other Western countries could rally behind. And lining up were the military contractors, infrastructure experts, and the international aid community who were essential to success 
and stood to profit from the money that would soon flow into the country. The Afghan elite got in line too. The Americans and their NATO allies soon learned that the Taliban though were never really defeated. Instead, they melted back into the countryside or sought sanctuary in Pakistan and, and did their, bided their time. They regrouped, restored themselves to fighting strength and returned to battle. So it's important to note the profound challenges the United States and NATO partners confronted when attempting a nation building effort in a desperately poor tribal country in the midst of an insurgency. To put the challenges in perspective, a little geography is in order. Afghanistan is about the size of Texas with a population of 39 million, about the same as California. It is home to numerous ethnic groups. The Pashtuns make up the largest group, but comprise less than 50% of the population. Tajiks are the second largest ethnic group, followed by Hazaris and Uzbeks. Afghanistan, of course, is a Muslim country, 80% of whom are the, of the Sunni faith, but the Taliban's strict Salafist version of Sunni Islam is practiced only by a minority of Afghans. There's also a large group of Afghans, principally the Hazaris, who practice the Shia version of Islam. In the past several weeks, the Hazaris have been target of several devastating suicide bombing attacks committed by ISIS-K, the Afghan branch of the Islamic State. And I'll talk more about them later. There are 35 documented languages spoken in Afghanistan. So here's a question I can ask the audience here. Which language is spoken by the most Afghans? Okay, I've heard Pashtun, I've heard a few things. Um, the answer is Dari, which is a version of Persian. There are differences between the Persian spoken in Iran and Dari spoken in uh, Afghanistan. But generally, a Dari speaking Afghan who travels to Tehran would be understood there in much the same way that a New Yorker traveling to Britain would be understood in London. The second most widely spoken language is Pashto, which is a different language than Persian. Afghanistan's third language is Uzbek, a Turkic language, which is completely different than the others. The number of Americans who speak these languages, especially members of the armed forces who would have the most contact with the Afghans was vanishingly small. But there are Afghans who speak English. They are the educated elites of the country. But if one cannot speak Dari, Pashto or Uzbek, it's hard to get the perspective of Afghans in the countryside who speak these languages. Thus the reality on the ground was often filtered through the path, the, the perspective of the Afghan elites. A senior US military commander who served in the Eastern province of Coast also noted that the cultural complexity of the environment is just so huge that it's hard for us to understand it. However low the Afghan economy had sunk during the period of communist rule in the 70s and 80s, it declined even more sub, uh, under subsequent Mujahideen and Taliban governments. In the face of the Taliban's harsh social policies, many educated Afghanis, Afghans, including those with technical skills, left the country. About 85% of the population of Afghanistan derives its livelihood from a rural economy, mostly as farmers. But only about one eighth of the total land area of Afghanistan is arable. And only about half of that is cultivated annually. And because much of the country is arid or semi-arid, about half of the cultivated land needs to be irrigated. Just prior to the arrival of the Americans, the economic activity that did flourish was in illicit enterprises, such as growing opium poppies for heroin production and the smuggling of goods. Poppy cultivation was the major source of income for farmers, though they shared little in its full profits. However, the drug economy provided essential revenues to the Taliban, both before and after the American occupation. 
by any standard, restoring government governance and boosting the economy while fighting a violent insurgency was going to be an enormous project. If geography is destiny, what other obstacles did the United States face? Afghanistan is located almost completely on the opposite side of the world of the United States. Projecting power across a great distance is a challenge under the best of circumstances. Afghanistan presented some of the worst of circumstances. As you know, Afghanistan is a landlocked country. This meant that the movement of troops, supplies, and civilian reconstruction materials had to pass through one of its neighbors. If you look at the map, two of its longest borders are with Iran to the west and Pakistan to the east. Right after 9-11, Iran assisted the United States in some important ways, but when President Bush declared that country part of the axis of evil, that was the end of any cooperation from them. This left Pakistan, a perfidious ally who was providing safe haven to Taliban fighters and Osama bin Laden. An alternative is to move material by air, but that is exceedingly expensive and limited by volume. Even if one staged from Europe, the distances are significant. A flight from Ramstein Air Base in Germany to Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan is about as long as a flight from the east coast of the United States to Germany. Historians will tell you that one of the biggest obstacles to remote military operations is transportation and logistics. In his classic study of supplying ground forces, the Israeli scholar Martin Van Krefeld argued that logistics make up as much as nine tenths of the business of war. Logistics is something the US military is exceptionally good at and they boast of their ability to create supply chains that extend from factory to foxhole. But the challenges in Afghanistan took the Pentagon down a peg. NATO did airlift military personnel and diplomats to Afghanistan, but supplies and equipment in the first years of the occupation were sent via commercial shipping lines to Karachi's Port Qasim. From there, they were trucked 1,200 miles through Pakistan by thousands of local contractors whose trucks and tankers took 10 days or more to complete the journey into Afghanistan. Eventually, a northern route was established, which involved a complex route by ship through the Mediterranean and Aegean seas, through the Dardanelles into the Black Sea, by land through Georgia and Azerbaijan, by ship again through the Caspian Sea, then overland through Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, where that country's notorious regime profited handsomely from the NATO supply chain through local rent seeking, windfall fees and outright graft. The green line on the map here shows you that particular route. You'll also see, thanks to a classic Pentagon slide, this from the Defense Logistic Agency, very busy. But you notice there was also a route for a time through Russia uh, by train. However, the Russians cut that off. But getting material to Afghanistan was only half the battle. These transnational supply chains ended at the main logistic hubs at Bagram and Kandahar. From there, the supplies had to be delivered to over 400 military bases scattered across Afghanistan. During its occupation between 1979 and 1989, the Red Army also depended on similar ground lines of communications with long convoys snaking through mountain passes and along narrow roads, which were frequently attacked by the Mujahideen. It was reported that the Soviets were obliged to devote 75% of its force structure to protecting its supply routes. Having studied the Soviet experience, the US Armed Forces sought to avoid these problems by relying on private contractors to manage and provide security for the internal supply chain. The idea was to free up troops to conduct offensive operations against the Taliban. As the United States began to surge troops into the country starting in 2009, the volume of military supplies increased as well. The Pentagon decided to consolidate its transportation operations into a single contract divided between eight companies. The responsibility for security was devolved to these prime contractors who subcontracted with or spun off private security companies to provide armed escort. Just six months after the contract became operational, 
This contracting bazaar had turned into what one call, commentator called a grotesque carnival in which the United States ended up funding the very forces its troops were fighting. This was because the principal private security contractors were warlords, strongmen, commanders, and militia leaders. A congressional inquiry found that these strongmen kept demand for their services high by attacking their rivals and even staging attacks on their own convoys. Many were alleged to have paid as much as 60% of the profits to the Taliban and to other criminal groups for protection and safe passage. As the United States wrestled with these many obstacles, the Taliban returned to the offensive. They employed the usual elements of guerrilla strategy, a stealth campaign of hit and run military attacks, selective assassinations to demoralize their adversaries, and acts of terror that both weakened the government and created an atmosphere of fear within local populations. Although they confronted overwhelming military force, the Taliban understood that in a war of national liberation, the trick is to wait out the invader. That requires the ability to sustain a certain casualty rate without losing your army. This was not, however, an original insight by the Taliban. They learned it from George Washington. The United States was assisted in its counterinsurgency and nation building effort by its NATO allies. The US military created a civil affairs framework to coordinate redevelopment with United Nations and non-governmental organizations and to expand the authority of the Kabul government. Provincial reconstruction teams or PRTs were established and handed over to NATO states. However, these lacked a central controlling authority and created what a US Institute of Peace report called an ad hoc approach to security and development. It was a problem in other areas too. A maze of so-called national caveats restricted the activities of member military forces, limiting the coalition's effectiveness. An International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF, was also established. ISAF was a NATO-led mission to train Afghan forces, assist in rebuilding government institutions, and to combat the Taliban insurgency. But out of earshot of the generals and politicians, American troops on the ground said that the abbreviation ISAF really stood for, I suck at fighting. Military commanders, members of Congress and executive branch policy makers were convinced that the more that was spent on schools, bridges, canals and other civil works projects, the faster security would improve in the country. Thus our Afghanistan enterprise became a story of mission creep in which as many as 140,000 troops under American command were deployed in a nation building project. As one US Marine put it, we're a football team. They're asking us to dance the ballet. We're pretty good athletes, so we're not terrible at it, but fundamentally we're still a football team. In order to support the nation building effort, the United States flooded Afghanistan with money. In fact, we allocated more than $133 billion to build up the country, which is more than we spent adjusted for inflation than we spent to revive the whole of Western Europe under the Marshall Plan after World War II. But it was far more than the country could absorb. In fact, the money had the effect of poisoning the country, embittering those who didn't have it and setting off rivalries between those who did it also gave rise to historic levels of corruption. A lessons learned study conducted by the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction was obtained by Washington Post reporter Craig Whitlaw and published in his book, The Afghanistan Papers. It painted a devastating picture of corruption. The st study documented interviews with American officials who made the following observations. A former State Department official said, our policy was to create a strong central government, which was idiotic because Afghanistan does not have a history of strong central government. An executive for the US Agency for International Development said, we lost objectivity. We were given money, told to spend it, and we did so without reason. A US Army colonel who deployed to Afghanistan several times said, 
By 2006, the Afghan government led by President Hamid Karzai had self-organized into a kleptocracy. US military trainers described the Afghan security forces as incompetent, unmotivated, and rife with deserters. They also accused the Afghan commanders of pocketing salaries for tens of thousands of ghost soldiers. Another US military officer called Afghan soldiers stealing fools who looted so much fuel from US bases, they perpetually smelled of gasoline. And finally, one senior Afghan official told an American diplomat in 2010, corruption is not just a problem for the system of governance in Afghanistan, it is the system of governance. But even then, only 12% of US reconstruction assistance went to the Afghan government. Some 40% of the money allocated to Afghanistan actually went back to donor countries in corporate profits and consultant salaries. So what did the Af Afghans get for all this American largesse? Here is a photo of the Tarheel diesel fuel power plant near Kabul built in 2007 at a cost of $335 million to the American taxpayer. It is the world's most expensive power plant of its kind. But diesel has to be imported into Afghanistan where it is both expensive and dangerous to transport. By 2015, the plant was producing only 1% of its capacity and only one third of 1% of Kabul's power. Afghanistan is the world's largest producer of opium and the main source of heroin exported to Europe and North America. The United States spent $9 billion over the past 18 years to fight the problem. The Brits thought they were onto something by paying farmers for the poppy crop and then destroying it. But the farmers broke the code on that. And the next year, they just grew even more poppies to sell to the Brits. The poppy eradication effort was another failure as production in Afghanistan has actually increased to record levels. In an effort to weed Afghan farmers off growing opium poppies, the US encouraged them to switch to other crops. They recommended saffron, pine nuts, and cotton, but these are far less lucrative than poppies, while rutted roads and poor storage infrastructure made exports difficult. In 2010, the Department of Agriculture paid the American Soybean Association to introduce soybeans to, American, uh, to Afghan farmers. One Afghan farmer who took part in the soybean project in Balkh province said there wasn't enough water to grow the crop, the proper seeds weren't available locally, and because the Afghan diet rarely included soy products, there was no market for the harvested crop. The program was another expensive failure. At the end of the day, instead of building a nation, the United States built more than 400 military bases while boosting the personal fortunes of the people who supplied them. Among the reasons the United States stayed so long in Afghanistan was the missionary zeal with which Americans brought to efforts to address poverty, illiteracy, and poor healthcare in the country. But surely another reason was that there were lots of people making lots of money there. And then there's this, the counterinsurgency campaign against the Taliban was fought not by draftees, but by a volunteer military. And it was paid for through deficit spending. A total of $1 trillion in direct war costs were debt financed. According to Elliot Ackerman, a former Marine Corps officer and veteran of the war in Afghanistan, this model of a volunteer military and debt financed war insulated most Americans to the costs of the conflict. This was especially so for the political, intellectual and economic elite who were America's influencers and decision makers. Few of their children serve in the armed forces, and during these war years, what they paid in taxes actually went down. U.S. troop strength in Afghanistan peaked during the Obama administration when the Pentagon persuaded a skeptical president that a surge of forces was needed to tackle the Taliban insurgency. U.S. forces were supported by their NATO allies, but the largest military contingent was from the United States. The US and NATO formally ended their combat mission at the end of 2014, but a 13,000 strong force was left there to help train the Afghan army and support counter-terrorist operations. 
At that point, the fight against the Taliban was turned over to the Afghan army, supported by US air, uh, advisors and air power. The United States had spent over $83 billion to train and equip the Afghan army, and now we would find out whether the investment would pay off. We learned the answer this past summer when the Afghan National Army suddenly folded like a cheap burqa. This outcome should not have been a big surprise. Throughout the war, the Taliban played the long game. They capitalized on mistakes by the Western coalition and its Afghan partners. They harnessed popular anger against human rights abuses, civilian deaths, and corruption to turn Afghans against the central government and its foreign backers. As one Taliban leader famously put it, the Americans have all the clocks, but we have the time. Although the US military scrupulously tries to avoid civilian casualties, the fact is that many rural Afghans were caught in the crossfire in America's fight with the Taliban. Many became casualties of US counterterrorism operations, drone strikes, and other battles. The United Nations reported that since the US troop surge in 2009, nearly 111,000 civilians were killed or injured in the country. According to Washington Post foreign correspondent Sadrasan Raghavan, in Kabul, and other Afghan cities, the United States will be remembered for enabling two decades of progress in women's rights and in independent media and freedoms. But in Afghanistan's hinterlands, where most of the fighting took place, many Afghans view the United States primarily through the prism of conflict, brutality, and death. When Donald Trump was inaugurated, he became the fourth American president to preside over the US enterprise in Afghanistan. In his 2019 State of the Union address, he declared that great nations do not fight endless wars. Soon thereafter, just as Gorbachev had done 30 years before, his administration began negotiations with the Taliban. On February 29, 2020, an agreement was reached in Doha, Qatar, to withdraw all US military forces the next year in return for Taliban guarantees that the country would not be used for terrorist activities. But there was yet a new president in office in 2021 when the withdrawal deadline would occur. That president, Joe Biden, made the decision to honor the agreement with the Taliban and set a deadline of August 31st for the withdrawal of US military forces. General Kenneth McKenzie, the commander of US Central Command, recommended keeping a few thousand troops in the country to help the Afghan government during the transition. But President Biden was convinced that keeping troops in the country for a few more years would not prevent an eventual Taliban victory. I was the fourth president to preside over an American troop presence in Afghanistan, two Republicans, two Democrats. He said later, I would not and will not pass this war on to a fifth. With the handwriting on the wall, the Taliban increased its pressure in the countryside, while Afghan security forces came to believe that fighting for President Ashraf Ghani's government wasn't worth dying for. Soldiers and police officers described moments of despair and feelings of abandonment. We are drowning in corruption, said Abdul Halim, a police officer on the Kandahar front line in early August. With a firm deadline for the American withdrawal in place, morale among Afghan security forces and local officials collapsed. By the time the Taliban began their, began their final offensive, the insurgents had flipped the provincial capitals and major cities one by one, often with no fighting at all. President Ghani fled Kabul on August 15th. The Taliban entered the city that day and took control of the presidential palace the next. That left one last mission for the United States military, which was the evacuation of the remaining American officials and troops, as well as those close Afghan partners and their families who might be risk of retaliation from the Taliban. It was described by the news media as a chaotic evacuation leading to outrage and finger pointing by members of Congress and commentators across the political spectrum. But this was a superficial observation which did not accurately reflect what really happened. 
The operation had many moving parts. Contrary to initial reporting, it was well-planned and superbly executed in a challenging environment with great risk. In the space of 17 days, the US Air Force Air Mobility Command airlifted on its military aircraft, aircraft or facilitated on commercial, private, and allied aircraft over 124,000 civilians, including 6,000 Americans, one of the largest airlifts in history. Veteran national security correspondent um, David Ignatius, whose contacts within the intelligence community in Washington are legendary, reported that the CIA and its Afghan allies on the ground remained a cohesive force. They rescued more than 2,000 US citizens, 4,000 local staff from the US Embassy, and 1,500 foreign journalists and workers from non-governmental organizations. And nearly every one of the CIA's secret allies got out safely. This was accomplished even as everything needed to operate Kabul airport, runway and taxi lights, radars, air traffic control systems and power supplies had been damaged or destroyed by crowds as they ran loose around the airport after the Taliban entered the city. A special operations team from the US Air Force got the airport up and running in record time to enable evacuation operations. Security on the ground around the airport was provided by US Marines and Army soldiers working cautiously but largely effectively with the Taliban who patrolled the outer perimeter. It was a perilous situation with thousands of Afghans crowding the airport per perimeter clamoring to leave. Those crowds at Kabul airport presented both a lucrative and vulnerable target for terrorists. On August 26, the terrorist group ISIS-K struck. Two militants exploded suicide vests at gates at the airport. 13 US service members and 179 Afghan civilians were killed. ISIS in the Khorasan or ISIS-K is the most extreme and violent of all the jihadist militant groups in Afghanistan. It sprang up six years ago and recruits, recruits both Afghan and Pakistani jihadists, especially members of the Afghan Taliban who don't see the Taliban as extreme enough. They were responsible for a school bombing in Kabul in May of last year that killed 80 schoolgirls. Between September 18th and October 28th this year, they carried out 54 attacks, including a suicide bombing at a Shiite mosque in Kunduz that killed 46. A week later, they conducted a suicide bombing of another Shiite mosque, this time in Kandahar province in Southern Afghanistan, killing 47. This past Tuesday, ISIS-K committed its latest terrorist outrage. Five of its militants attacked Afghanistan's main military hospital in Kabul, killing at least 25 and wounding 50 more. Among the names of those Americans killed at Kabul airport in August were Ryan and Umberto, Jared and Karim, and Yohani and Nicole. Yohani was Marine Sergeant Yohani Rosario from Lawrence, Massachusetts. Nicole was Marine Sergeant Nicole Gee from Roseville, California. Their deaths remind us that women now make up a large portion of the US military's manpower and they are making the same sacrifices as their male comrades. After the attacks, President Biden declared, to those who carried out this attack, we will hunt you down and make you pay. The next day, the US military carried out a drone strike which killed two ISIS-K militants. Two days later, another drone strike was launched. The intended target was a suspected ISIS-K car bomb in Northwest Kabul neighborhood. But instead, it struck the car of Zamari Ahmadi, an engineer working for a US-based NGO, Nutrition and Education International. He had been out running errands, including filling containers with water, which was misinterpreted by the US military as loading explosives for use in a terrorist attack. As Ahmadi pulled into his driveway, several members of his extended family ran out to, to greet him. A total of 10 were killed when the missile struck. Seven of them were children. The attack was emblematic of the toll on Afghan civilians during America's Afghanistan enterprise. No matter how hard you try to avoid doing so, when your objective is to win hearts and minds, killing civilians is disastrous. <laughs>
What followed in the weeks after the American withdrawal was the public reckoning. On September 28th, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley, and CENTCOM Commander General Kenneth McKenzie faced tough questioning and a lot of grandstanding at a hearing of the Senate Armed Services Committee. What Secretary Austin said at the hearing deserves to be quoted. We need to consider some uncomfortable truths that we did not fully comprehend the depth of corruption and poor leadership in their senior ranks, that we did not grasp the damaging effect of frequent and unexplained rotations by President Ghani of his commanders, that we did not anticipate the snowball effect caused by the deals the Taliban commanders struck with local leaders in the wake of the Doha agreement, that the Doha agreement itself had a demoralizing effect on Afghan soldiers, and that we failed to fully grasp that there was only so much for which and for whom many of the Afghan forces would fight. We provided the Afghan military with equipment and aircraft and the skills to use them. Over the years, they often fought bravely. Tens of thousands of Afghan soldiers and police officers died. But in the end, we couldn't provide them with the will to win, at least not all of them. Gerald Seib, the veteran journalist for the Wall Street Journal, summed it up this way. In retrospect, it appears that the American public had only one priority in Afghanistan. It was to stop the Al-Qaeda terrorism threat that produced the 9-11 attacks. For most Americans, after Osama bin Laden was killed in 2011, the primary motivation for being in Afghanistan was gone. Building a democracy in Afghanistan, creating a stable partner in the region, even protecting the rights of Afghan women and girls from the harsh excesses of Islamic extremists did not justify a costly and open-ended commitment. But that still leaves the Afghan women and girls. What becomes of them? Thousands have been evacuated. Many will resettle in the United States and enrich American society. But what about the rest? Women have always been the target of the Taliban. When the Taliban came to power in 1996, Afghan women were all but excluded from public life and allowed to leave their homes only when accompanied by a male relative. Many girls were prohibited from attending schools or to work. There were even public executions of women, including those accused of so-called moral offenses. How will today's Taliban govern? Afghan civil society has burgeoned in the past two decades. Women have assumed public positions, not just in Kabul, but in smaller cities. Cell phones and social media did not exist when the Taliban first took power. Can they govern the country if they reimpose the same uncompromising Islamist rule? Only time will tell. The future of women in the country will be among the many legacies of the American enterprise in Afghanistan. So I'll stop there and be happy to take your questions. We will alternate questions here in the Burger Center and on Zoom. Are there any questions? Uh, Lynn, may I make a comment first, which is if you have a question and know how to electronically raise your hand, you're welcome to do that. Or you can enter it into the chat and we'll try to get to you when it's your turn. Yes, we have a burger question. First, thank you very much, Mark. That was very informative. Wonderful, thank you. Um, while you were talking and we were watching in hindsight what's gone on and how much clearer it is in hindsight, um, I'm a, a child of the Vietnamese War and read the press then and I'm reading the press now. And I was raised to believe that uh, propaganda was outside of our borders as far as news goes. Do you have any comments on, let's just take one, the New York Times uh, and what it, how it portrays our involvements in foreign countries? Um, 
in a in an unbiased way where we can get a better idea, where we can get some of this hindsight that you have a little earlier, and that it's not all in hindsight. Do you, do you believe that our pre, our press? I hate to say it, is uh, some of it is fake news in the press. What's why, why are we in this situation as far as information goes? I, I certainly see what you're saying now. Um, I didn't see it in 2011, any time like that. What, what do you think's going on? Or is there anything going on? Are they just being innocent and understanding the big picture and the Times doing its best? I, I, it, it doesn't have to be the Times, any, any paper is doing their best to inform us. Thank you. Well, you, you, you mentioned the New York Times, which is probably you know one of the two or three best uh, news organizations in the world, uh, and and you know put a lot of effort into trying to cover it. But you know, to some extent, they suffer from some of the same uh, problems that the U.S. government officials did, which is there was a tendency for them to be in the cities and in Kabul and talking to the Afghan elites. It, it isn't true that none of them didn't get out into the field, but I don't know that they had a full appreciation at all times about that. But I think really the, you know, and the popular media doesn't deal too much. And when I talk about that, it's a little bit of kind of the generic TV news, and things like that. I think you have to look at the U.S. Armed Forces and the U.S. and, and, and American politicians, remember from both parties, which supported this effort for 20 years. So it was a real bipartisan kind of thing. And let's face it, it was um, a very well-intentioned enterprise. We were trying to help the Afghanistan people, not like we did after the Soviets left, where we just kind of abandoned the field, but really tried to get in there. But when things were going south and the money kept stocking up and the Taliban were still persistent, I don't know that the politicians sat down and really critically um, looked at the problem. I know President Obama tried to do that a little bit and he was really excoriated in Congress and by the other party about doing that. So he, he reluctantly agreed to, uh, to a surge to try to at least get on top of the Taliban insurgency. But anyway, I don't think it's fair to blame the media. I, I think sometimes um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of shooting the messenger there a little bit. Uh, Catherine had a question. Catherine, do you wanna pose your question? Certainly. Mark, uh, first off, uh, thank you uh, from Pebble Creek. Uh, we really enjoyed your recent presentation to us. Oh, too. hi. How are you? Thank so, you. Very well received. My question to you on this one is what can be done to prevent this from happening again after Vietnam and now Afghanistan and maybe smaller efforts in between? Because the only thing we get out of this is lessons learned. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, in, in fairness, the United States is going through something of a uh, 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 lessons learned on, on all aspects of this. And one of the best examples of it was the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. And that goes back a few years. The United States really, the government, really tried to say what exactly happened. And that report is quite uh, thorough and quite devastating. And uh, by the way, speaking to the media, Craig Whitlock was relentless with his Freedom of Information Act requests and other things to get the access to that report so he could publish it and say, look, guys, this is what the problem is. I think the United States government probably some years ago realized that the Afghanistan enterprise was, was a losing proposition. It was the problem was no president wanted to be the one to do what Biden ended up doing. If, and if you can see how Biden was sort of excoriated for it and the way the US military was raked over the coals in the congressional hearings by both parties, you can see why politicians are very reluctant to be the ones to you know, wrap up an operation and, and, and stand to be accused of losing a war. We have another question here, Mark. Uh, if you look at the Taliban today, they appear to be having some difficulty putting it all together. They have opposition in the country. Uh, they have a lack of money, a lack of an understanding how to run a somewhat modern economy. Who is going to help them from here forward? 
So that's a good question. Um, I'm going to answer that by suggesting something that has not been talked about a lot, but which I think needs to be by the United States. We may think that the Taliban is among the worst, uh, the, 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 the rules, you know, the Sharia law, the harsh Islamist rule that they're established is some of the worst that you could possibly have. But you have to step beyond that and look at your strategic interests. And I think America's strategic interests, believe it or not, are to form some kind of a partnership, maybe a little bit too generous of a word, but needs to work with the Taliban. Because who the real bad guys are, are like ISIS-K and some of the other extreme jihadists. And if the Taliban is unable to deliver food, basic governance and so forth in the country, it's these extremist groups that will continue to run rampant and even possibly gain more adherence. So there is some strategic interest in the United States to work carefully with the Taliban. Um, now, right now, they're keeping us at arm's length as it comes to fighting ISIS-K, although the Taliban is uh, supposedly taking some help from Pakistan. But we could help them a lot in that area. Um, but we're going to have to swallow the fact that the Taliban are uh, not exactly the kind of people we, you know, we like in terms of the way they govern. However, let's remember, we have very vital strategic interests, and it's allowed the United States to look the other way in Egypt, which is a dictatorship, which uses very harsh uh, measures to control the population. Uh, the difference between the Taliban and Saudi Arabia isn't that great, okay? Especially if you're a woman in Saudi Arabia. And yet strategic interests have us not only embrace, not only work with Saudi Arabia, but consider them an ally. And I could go on and on with some other countries and historically, and there's reasons for that because one strategic, you know, we may have a preference for, you know, the government of Sweden in terms of how society is organized, but our strategic interest may be that we have to work with these countries that are not so nice. Um, I'd like to follow up on your comments about uh, Biden's withdrawal. I remember screaming at the television and screaming at Biden. I understand you had a date that you wanted to leave, but would it have helped to say to everything that was going on, we're leaving, you see we're leaving, stop uh, ma making it so difficult for us to get out. We wanna get all our people out, we wanna get whatever. Would that have helped if he had made a comment and had extended a little more time to get everybody out? Didn't he realize what would have happened when he saw you know, what was gonna happen to him and the whole situation? So the, um... The fact is that, that the United States and the Taliban did work together in a certain way to allow the Americans to, to execute its withdrawal, okay? They, they helped, they did provide some security, they did not attack the Americans. But I guarantee you, and by the way, the Doha agreement was negotiated by Donald Trump, Biden said, okay, and Biden could change it. He could uh, renege on the agreement, but you do know what would happen if, if he had done that. The Taliban would have gone back to war against the Americans. We would have absolutely had to put thousands more troops in to protect the, the embassy and all of our facilities and so forth. Um, that's what was gonna happen. You would have gone back to war with the Taliban if we had not honored the agreement. So honoring the agreement uh, gave us the space to make the decision, uh, to, to, to execute the withdrawal that, by the way, there was a tremendous bipartisan consensus on this. Uh, even during the withdrawal itself, which was getting a lot of you know, pictures on TV that looked crazy, 70% of Americans in a poll said it was the right thing to do to leave. And it was, on both sides, not just Democrats or, or Republicans, it was both, both sides. So there was, um, you know, I think Americans had had enough uh, and were ready to, to, to wrap it up. 
So, uh, so I don't think you know staying longer was going to do much good for you. Jeff, you had a question. Jeff can't hear you. I just got the room mic. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, and these are both points that I just kind of want your perspective on. Um, Americans watching American media of any color uh, get a very sanitized view of war because the reporters that are embedded with the US military or supported by the military are not allowed to show some of the grisly details. They're not show, allowed to show uh, injured troops or uh, uh, troops that have been killed, things like that. Um, so I'm wondering your comments just on the sanitized view of war that we get and uh, some of the knock-on effects of that. And um, what was my other question? Go ahead and comment on that. I'll ask my other well, question. Well, I, I, I think that uh, it, it's, I, I wouldn't, I, I, the implication of your question is somehow if Americans got to see, you know, the blood and the gore and the blown out arms and, and so forth, that they would then, you know, turn against the war or would have a different view. I'm not 100% convinced that that would be true. Uh, and, but I think the, the way that that's presented, uh, I, I guess if I can use the analogy of the difference between movies that I watched when I was a kid growing up versus movies today. When I was a kid, you could hear a bang and hear a body fall down. And you know what? You knew somebody got killed. Today, if they don't blow the brains out and splatter them against the wall, it's not a movie. Okay, I do not find that any more compelling from a literary or, or cinematographic perspective you know, than, than the way it was done before. So I just don't think showing graphic things and it's not only just war, you know, they don't show the blood and guts on the street when there's an auto accident or things like that either. It's just a question of kind of the, the ethics of that. So I'm, I'm not sure that that would make a whole lot of difference in, in my opinion. Okay. And another point just for your comment, I appreciate that. Um, and I'm blanking. <laughs> yeah. um, if you think of it later, just come up to me and I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, Powell developed the, what was known as the Powell Doctrine, uh, a number of elements that should be in place before we enter a war in order to wage it successfully. Um, would that have helped in Afghanistan? Well, uh, again, uh, I, 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 th this would require a longer answer because when you refer to the Powell Doctrine, he had like 14 or 13 points. Um, uh, about what should happen before you go into a war, uh, but you don't always have the uh, luxury of having wars lend themselves to, uh, you know, all these different kinds of factors. Also, we, we keep using the term war, and I want to really distinguish between a war like World War II or Korea versus a war or a conflict which is a fighting an insurgency. Fighting an insurgency is totally different. Uh, it's very complicated. You're in the midst of what's almost like a civil war. Uh, and uh, it's very, very complicated and different way than fighting a sort of a conventional military campaign where uh, the objective is to, you know, destroy the enemy and, 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 and achieve your political objectives that way. Um, it, 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 no matter what you're going to do, you're probably not going to eradicate the Taliban. Uh, certainly the United States tried to, you know, tamp down the insurgency and they killed a lot of Taliban militants, but there's always going to be some that are going to pop up. And when they can kind of hide within the population, I think that was a, a big lesson too from Vietnam where the Viet Cong were very difficult to, to root out. Uh, at the end of the war, of course, we were basically fighting the North Vietnamese, but, um, but before that it was you know, Viet Cong, which were also you know, essentially insurgents and they were able to hide among the population. So um, I, I know that doesn't directly address all of the points of the Powell Doctrine, but it, the Powell Doctrine is, is something that you know, uh, strategists will, will always talk about and, 
consider some of the issues he raised. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much for a absolutely comprehensive and insightful. Is that too loud? <laughs> okay. Uh, commentary. It rings so true for the the time I worked there between 2001 and 2015. Um, the one point I thought you might have been able to elaborate a little bit more was the role of Pakistan. In, but I know you said perfidious and that covers a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, but my question is, we've still left, what, 150,000 SIV uh, priority, you know, uh, people who are eligible for American visas uh, there. And I'm working with my ex staff and colleagues and they can't get processed. They can't, they can't get out to the airport. The black market price of getting across any of the borders now is astronomical. And I'm just wondering, I agree with you that we have to have a working arrangement with the Taliban. And I'm just wondering if you think that that is in the cards to be able to do something like that. Yeah, good, good question. Well, there's two parts to that I want to address. Number one, I, 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 if I talk more about Pakistan and its role, it would have been maybe almost a different speech. Um, but one of the points I made is you, you notice how we were so dependent on Pakistan to move our supplies to support not only our armed effort, but, but reconstruction effort and so forth. We had to go through Pakistan. And so, you, you know, if you don't, if you put too much pressure on them on other issues, uh, they can just cut you off. So that was the deal with them. It's very complicated also because Pakistan plays kind of a double and triple game uh, for its own strategic interest, because who is you know, Pakistan's biggest enemy? Well, it's India. And the problem historically has been Afghanistan kind of, and India have kind of been sort of friendly. So they are really careful not to have that happen again. So that's the Pakistan question. On the other thing, this is a, a lingering uh, issue uh, so the question we have to ask ourselves is just exactly who are these people that we consider to be uh, deserving of being, uh, you know, coming into the United States? If you, if you ask Afghans, out of the 39 million, probably 38 million, 500,000 would leave if they could. Okay, so that means not the 79,000 Taliban, and not the 500,000 people that just, you know, they're wherever. They'd all leave. Afghanistan is the second largest source of refugees in the world today, even before we left. Two million of them are in Iran, and a million of them are in Pakistan. Okay, everybody wants out. All right. So when people come up with these numbers, or you hear, well, we left our Afghan allies behind, you know, well, who are we talking about here? Are we talking about the cousin of the sister of the friend's person who was the translator? Are we going down to that level of, of familial and friend connection, you know, of who should get, who should leave? We got out the highest priority ones, as many as we could, but it's true that we're still working with the Taliban. And my understanding is they are, kind of letting some leave slowly. So uh, I don't, I, I don't want to over, uh, I wouldn't overstate this, this issue. I mean, if having worked there and you know some of these people, of course you'd love to see them get out, but there's going to be limits to what our power is and to what, you know, we, what we could do in a situation like this. Art, you had a question. Do you want to tackle it? Yes, uh, Mark, I believe we're still holding Taliban funds frozen. And if that's true, what's your advice to the Biden administration about how to leverage that um, to help keep ISIS from taking Kabul and having an utter and total disaster? Can yeah, we thank you, Art. And, and Art is a former Oakmonter who, who left for greeter pastures on Alameda Island, but he has tuned in today and I'm thrilled and he's asked a good question as he always does. Uh, it is true that we're, we have frozen billions in funds 
Uh, and that, those funds are a big leverage for the United States with the Taliban for things like getting people out. But it's also something we can use uh, to you know, foster a strategic relationship. Let me put it that way, a strategic relationship. Remember, countries do not have friends. They have interests. And we have interests in Afghanistan still, to some extent. And, one of the, and what are, what's the most important interest? That Afghanistan not become a safe haven or a platform for conducting terrorist attacks, not only against the United States, but other parts of the world. The United States since 9-11 has really uh, become uh, much stronger in its security, and it's going to be much harder to attack us in the way that happened on 9-11. Not impossible, of course, but still hard. But other countries and allies could be attacked. So using the money that Art mentions uh, is, is a way to, um, uh, and, and I think the United States should be willing to release these funds, not, not because necessarily they are letting these girls go to school, even though that's very desirable, but rather other things that are really, really highly interest on a, on a strategic level. I think we're winding down. George, are there any last important questions on Zoom? Um, yeah, we had one last one. Um, the, there, there have been several cases now, and Afghanistan's one. We just talked about the people left in Afghanistan. Um, Syria, Vietnam, et cetera, where when we left, people who were left behind were <clears throat> natives who were left behind, were at serious risk. Okay, is there any better way to do it than what we did in Afghanistan in terms of withdrawal? Well, I, I really wouldn't say that I'm an expert on this, but I think that it was actually done much better than has been, than has been reported. Um, I think we got out the key people that were at greatest risk from Taliban retaliation. Uh, that doesn't mean that some might still not, not be at risk. Uh, but when you talk about being there for as long as we were and engaged in as many places with as many people, uh, we're talking, you know, some contacts and, and somebody could be a translator, somebody could have been a fixer, you know, to facilitate things. Others are people who just simply pointed out the, you know, the best watering hole in Jalalabad to, you know, to the diplomats when they came into town. Um, so you have to pick and choose. Uh, but as far as doing it better, if you're going to, if you are going to leave and then the security situation collapses as quickly as it did, and I don't think there, it was, it should have been that big of a surprise, but whether it was, you know, anticipated or not, the fact is the government collapsed and then you had to get out and you didn't have a lot of time. I thought it was a pretty amazing effort what we did do to get out the way we did. Uh, and I think the, the term chaotic withdrawal should be uh, removed from the lexicon because that just isn't really an accurate re reflection of what had happened. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you.